You're listening to Sacks in the Basement, a production of the Broadcast Basement Limited, where every show is 30 minutes of good and comes from a basement bar on the south side of Chicago. Pull up a stool, pour a cold one, and join us right now for Sacks in the Basement. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found and always at SacksInTheBasement.com. So many really kind words sent to this uh, this guy right here after the Nancy Faust interview, and I just want to say thanks to everybody, including Nancy. Midnight, on Saturday night, my cell phone goes off, and my wife's like, who is texting you at this hour? Like, I got those that look. Oh, the, the one where it's, uh, excuse me, mister, you're not supposed to be getting texts because everybody that you need to text you at midnight is right here. Right, right. And it came up as Nancy. And she's like, who's Nancy? I'm like, Nancy Faust is texting me. Because she kept getting so many things sent to her about how good the interview was. And she was really excited about the fact she got to talk about things and tell her story and play the organ. She saw the she saw the reaction on social media from all the White Sox fans. And she sees you all saying things like she should be back and the White Sox need to bring her back. And she should at least be playing every once in a while out there. And the suggestion that she would be great every Sunday there or on throwback day. She sees it. And you know what? She agrees with you. I guarantee you she would go back into the ballpark if she was invited for either a throwback or special nights or anything like that. The ball's in the in, in the court of the White Sox, and they they don't really seize on the opportunity to, to connect with their fan base, so they'll probably miss the entire thing that's happening right now, which is this upswelling of love for somebody who's a White Sox legend who appeared on Socks in the Basement in the last episode, and you see social media going nuts, and she'll be at Cork and Carry at the park the night this episode releases. This episode comes out and is first released on the 25th of July. It's a Tuesday. She's at Cork and Carry at the park tonight. 5 to 7, Cork and Carry at the park, 33rd in Princeton, in the shadow of the ballpark, the place for pregame and postgame. Bring the entire family over, especially for Nancy. And get over there afterwards uh, to either celebrate the rare White Sox win or commiserate on this season and talk about the possible trades uh, afterwards at that big, beautiful bar, indoor, outdoor seating, great food out there, award-winning burgers, 33rd in Princeton, see more at CorkandCarry.com. But uh, how, how are you handling the trade talk? Because it's going to get stupid here for the next week. Yeah. I, I mean, that's that's just the thing is it... it y- you know, you hear all the rumors, the thoughts that are out there, and everybody's got a different opinion, you know, from trade everybody. You know, I saw Steve Stone sitting there saying, well, who would you focus on trading? And, you know, quell the trade everybody, fire everybody talk, please, you know, because he's trying to have a real discussion. Yeah, because he doesn't want to talk about that. If you want to fix the team, it's not through trade. You fix the team by cleaning house in the front office. The team becomes better if you get rid of Kenny Williams and Rick Hahn, and Chris Getz, and all of these people that over the years have taken this organization and driven it into the ground. I thought about this the other day. I was like, for all of the talk that Ken Williams has had over the years about how much he loves Jerry Reinsdorf and how important Jerry Reinsdorf is to him, the disservice that he's doing to Jerry Reinsdorf right now and to the legacy of Jerry Reinsdorf by remaining in that position doing nothing with the people that are below him, keeping all of these people around and not himself looking to exit because it isn't working and dragging down the organization with every moment that he's there. The man is just full of it. You could sit there all the time and put on your dark sunglasses and make your sad faces and talk about how much you love the man, but you being in there does him a detriment and you should leave. If he isn't going to fire you, do the honorable thing. And leave and take the clown show with you that you have inside of there. I mean, right now, as a fan, I feel like the most realistic thing that happens is that Rick Hahn gets removed at the end of the year and Pedro Grafal is hung around his neck because everything that I've heard from people who are within the organization or know somebody that's been a part of the discussions over the last couple of years have all said the same thing from different sources. Pedro was not a unanimous choice. Rick wanted a guy, finally. And... Jerry knows that Rick was unhappy with La Russa and probably didn't appreciate the fact that Rick would kind of throw shade towards the La Russa hire. And so now this is Rick's guy, and Rick's guy is saying the dumbest things on a daily basis. Oscar Colas, 
His boom box is at a 10. We need it to be at an eight. No, I want my rookies playing full out. What are you talking about? In this town, too, if you know anything about the Cubs, you know that boom boxes are still a hot button subject 30 <laughs> years on. So th- this is, yeah, I mean, Pedro is, you know, he, he's talking about, for example, Aloy Jimenez playing with uh, pulled groin because they need his bat in the lineup. And, th- you know, they don't put Aloy on, on the IL. They don't put Andrew Fawn on the IL. Can I read that quote before you dive into it? Because I want everybody who didn't oh, hear yeah, the quote. Yeah, yeah. Okay, here we go. This came out of the Sun-Times. This is Pedro uh, being asked about Aloy. And here it is. Uh, this is our manager. I'm glad you mentioned that because he's not running down the line and I choose to put him in there with that kind of effort down the line. I want his bat over his legs. I want to make sure I get that out of there clearly for everybody. I choose his bat over his legs. That's all he can give us. I'll continue to monitor that. And if I think it becomes a problem for us where he's going to get hurt or compromise us in any way running the bases, then I'll make a change. But for right now, I'm choosing his bat over his legs. Aloy Jimenez is dealing with a sore groin, which any man will tell you, you can make a lot worse if you don't stop using it as often. Like, that isn't a muscle that just gets better if you continue to to put strain on it, running around and playing baseball. So he's asked, will he get a day off tomorrow? This is on Saturday. This is on Saturday. The White Sox at this moment, when this question is asked, are 18 games under 500. They lost, by the way, on Sunday and now are 19 under. And 11 games out of first in fourth place, they lost anyway. They're actually 12. But think of how bad it was at that moment. And he goes, I'm not giving him a day off tomorrow. He's playing tomorrow. We've got to win that ball game tomorrow. You've got to win that ball game tomorrow. It's over. I wish the article then said that Pedro reached into his pocket, took out a little red ball, and put it on his nose because he's a clown. Because that's how the article should finish. I mean, really, everybody's walk-up music should just be da 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 It's but, but it's 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 getting to a point where where I'm you know I'm frustrated for Aloy Jimenez. I'm sure he wants to play. I mean, I, I I don't doubt the guy you know wants to be out there if he can be. But you're right. If you've got a pulled groin, if you've got a strained groin, if your groin is even slightly sore, I don't want to get out of bed if I've got that. I don't want to mess with that. But Pedro is continuing to do things that are. You know, you you can't tell if it's because he's handcuffed, for example, by having two guys who are hurt who shouldn't even be on the active roster right now and can't do anything to, to you know, get him out of there. I, you know, why isn't Victor Reyes up here playing in the outfield or, or doing something? I, you know, I mean, you just have options out there, and at this point it does not matter. Do they know there's an I.L.? I don't know if they do. Vaughn's walking around in a walking boot. You don't have money IL. Like, like on one hand, you're telling me that game the next day is so important. You're going to take one of your players who's clearly injured and risk further injury by playing him because the game is so damn important. But it's not important enough to IL the guy in the walking boot so you have enough players to possibly win the game. No, you're playing the game with one arm tied behind your back, and then you're saying things like this. Like, I thought Tony La Russa said stupid things, right? I thought that Tony La Russa said things that suggested that he might be on the verge of actual senility. This guy, this guy is somehow worse. But I, I think it's coming from the top. I mean, think think about it. You've got, you've got Ricky Renneria. We got on him for things. And then we got on Tony for things, and then we get on Pedro Grafol for things. I, that's you know, Renneria had had some success with the Cubs, so he wasn't like a complete novice manager. Tony Larusa is a Hall of Famer for gosh sakes, and yeah, he's a little you know, a little aged, a little unhealthy. Game may have passed him or whatever. Now you got Pedro, who's the the you know the the young guy who had all these great ideas and had diagnosed all the all the internal problems with the White Sox, and they're all turned into these sort of mush brained can't even make up the things like you and I could not get on with like an AI or a group of comedy writers and come up with some of the things that the managers of the White Sox have come up with over the last four years. Because I, I just, I think that they're getting to a point where they look at the roster they're handed. They look at the roster construction. They get things like the front office, not putting guys on the IL, even though they're limping around in walking boots 
And they're just sitting there going, you know, they got to sit there and say things like, I want his bat. I don't care about his legs. Uh, you know, and it's sitting there like, I don't know if Pedro even believes that he's saying that. So if he's putting the clown nose on, I think he's probably holding up a picture of Rick and Kenny and just, you know, doing a little punch and Judy puppet show with him, too. If you care deeply about your mother and father, your grandma and grandpa, let's say that they're they're injured, they're ill, they're they're getting on an age and you care about them more than the White Sox care about their players who are dealing with issues, you may want to go to Hyatt Home Medical Equipment and help them switch to a new age of life. Make it so they can get around on their own and live independently. It's all about staying independent and in your home. Stair lifts, ramps, grab bars, lift chairs, even bathroom remodeling. Hyatt is going to work with your insurance. They have 0% financing for qualified individuals. And if you mention socks in the basement, you get additional money off. If you use a CPAP machine... And, and, you know, I have an uncle who just insisted over and over again to my aunt that he had absolutely no problem. And they hooked him up to this, this testing thing to see whether or not he was sleeping soundly. And he stopped breathing on an average of once every 45 seconds for like an hour. So now he has a CPAP machine. If you're unhappy with your vendor, if you want to see the latest and greatest, if you want to test it out, they have testing facilities in their showroom. They also have the latest in continuous glucose monitors. Learn all about them at hhme.com or stop in and see Hyatt Home Medical Equipment at 3518 West 95th Street in Evergreen Park. Rick Hahn and the White Sox front office can only be compared at this point to that guy in your fantasy sports league who thinks they know a lot about, let's say it's a baseball league. They know a lot about baseball or in a football league. They think they know a lot about football. They only know about 20% of the players. They make terrible trades. You know, you can fleece them and they set really bad starting lineups to the point where other players are asking the commissioner, do, do you think that's a dead team? Should we have somebody else take that team over? That's what the White Sox are with all of their decision-making from top to bottom. And that's why I become concerned as the trade deadline is approaching because these are the people that are going to make the decisions. This is why it's not fair for Steve Stone to say, what would you like to see the White Sox do in the trade market, but don't talk about firing people. No, 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 no. These people are going to keep making the decisions. So whatever they do frightens the heck out of me. Like Jonathan India, the White Sox could be dumb enough to overpay with the fact that the Reds are putting out there right now that the former rookie of the year, who's still very young and has some talent, is available and they're looking for long-term starting pitching. Because he's not a bad player, but there's a reason why they're moving on from him. It's because they have such an abundance of players coming to the majors or just arriving or have just gotten there in the last week or so with Encarnacion Strand. And you've got uh, uh, Spencer Steer is there. Cruz, Spencer Steer, Matt McClain is their starting shortstop. Uh, Noel V. Marte is one of their top prospects. I mean, they've got shortstops. They've got more shortstops then the White Sox have walking wounded players who will never see the IL. Yes, and they they can get rid of a Jonathan India. So what they're hoping is that you'll just get really excited about a guy who basically has an OPS, which is league average, has a WRC plus that's league average, weighted runs created, okay, plays fairly good defense and gets on a hot streak every once in a while. It's a valuable player to have. It's an upgrade at second base for the White Sox. If you overvalue that, which is what they're trying to say, they're saying we want a pitcher and we want pitching that we can control for several years. Well, what is that that the White Sox are going to trade them? You're not giving Dylan Cease for him because Cease is far more valuable than Jonathan India. Giolito might be an even move, but if they want long-term pitching, you're not going to get it. What is it, Kopech? I mean, if I'm the Reds, I'm looking at this guy going, I'm not sure he's any better than any of the guys that we've brought up that we've had to send down because... You know, they're unpredictable on the mound. One one minute, one game, you get Michael Kopech, the dominator, you know, with, with an amazing fastball and, and filthy slider and just, you know, looks like a world beater. And then the next game, he's tipping pitches and getting knocked out in two-thirds of an inning. Yeah, he's really good against bad teams. That's what he is. He's really good against bad teams. He's a fourth or fifth starter. He's a major league right, pitcher right. who's at the back of your rotation who may still have some potential the Reds are hoping that people look at Jonathan India and say, look how young he is. Look at that first year, because the first year is his best year statistically. And then look at the fact that, like, worst case scenario, you're getting a guy who's league average and plays good defense. So that, you know, 
there are a lot of below average hitting second basemen out there. So this would be, and it would be an upgrade for a team like the White Sox and several other teams in Major League Baseball, right? And they're hoping that you're like, but look at the potential. And the White Sox would be trying to deal the Reds somebody. It's like, but look at the potential of Michael Kopech, right? Right. Even though everybody's already seen that the potential of Michael Kopech has kind of gone by the wayside here. Right. Like the Reds are hoping that they know more about India than you do and you'll pay too much. And the White Sox would be trying to hope that the Reds don't know as much about Kopech as they do. And and again, that's what that's something a competent front office could pull off, not these jokers. Well, but you know what? To, back to your point about that guy in your fantasy baseball league that that overvalues certain players based on name recognition and doesn't really know much about the league and doesn't really know much about what's going on beyond like his favorite team. One of the one of the hallmarks of that is, is that when they go after a guy like Jonathan India. They sit there and go, oh, it's Jonathan India. I, I got to get John. I, he's available. Are you kidding me? I got whatever you want. Whatever you here. Shut up and take my money. And they become fry right from from Futurama. And, you know, that's what you worry that Rick Hahn sometimes becomes when he sees somebody like Yohan Moncada is available. He's the number one prospect in baseball. Shut up and take my money. And and you sit there and you go, OK, well, he got the number one prospect in baseball. But did he really do his homework on the guy? Did he really know if this guy was going to hit? Did he really know if this guy could play second base, which is the position the, the Sox put him in in the first place? What did you do to make sure that you got a player that fit what you want and what you need? And Jonathan India, you're right. He would stabilize second base for the White Sox for the next few years. And Michael Kopech is probably a fourth or fifth starter. Seems like a match that might possibly be made if the Reds are sitting there going, yeah, you know what, we'll, we'll take a chance at Kopech's there. And and if nothing else, maybe we can turn Kopech into a closer. We can make him back into a reliever or something like that. But at the same time... At the same time, you don't have any pitching. And, and that's that's the problem. If there's a team out there that's looking for White Sox pitching, there's nothing next year. There's no controllable pitching. No. You have nothing. Noah Schultz. You're not trading him for Jonathan India. Right. I like India. If the White Sox traded Kopech for India, I'd be like, all right, well, let's see how this works out. I mean, deep down in the back of my mind, I'd be like, watch Michael Kopech all of a sudden become a really good pitcher. <laughs> that's like, that's how that would work. Oh, against like, the National League Central, maybe he does. You know, against against some of those teams, yeah. But but here's the thing. I also look at it and I say, okay, you're, you're going to have to give up something for India just because of name recognition alone, the fact that he won a Rookie of the Year, all that stuff like that. You're looking at a guy that over his first 1,500 plate appearances – has hit 258 with a 772 OPS, which is just a little bit above what average would be for that amount of time. 45 home runs, so 15 a year is what is what he's averaging when he goes up there. And again, plays a pretty good second base. He's a, he's a good ball player. He's a major league baseball player. You'd be happy to have him in your in your lineup. So if the White Sox had a plan for what they were going to do with their rotation, and let's say uh, Michael Kopech was the asking price, then okay, that makes an awful lot of sense. On the other hand... I, I look at other teams that probably need stuff that we have, right? Like the Rangers are in a race. If they if, if they're interested, if they're a team that's knocking on the door for uh for another starting pitcher, and they're doing that, I would like the guy that is hitting 271 right now in Triple A playing second base for them with an 866 OPS and seven. Uh, how many home runs he's got? 11 home runs so far this year in in triple a in justin foscu i'd rather have that yeah guy. A, a guy who's a blocked prospect who makes all the sense in the world for right. the rangers to move blocked prospect that they need to move on from that's still unproven so the asking price isn't as high that's the thing the asking price isn't as high because he's unproven and he's still in triple a right and they need to move him just like jonathan india's in the way for the reds foscu's in the way for the rangers you could probably get foscu for less than what you'd have to pay for India because of the name recognition of a guy who a couple years ago won Rookie of the Year and is a professional baseball player that's been... Has he been to an All-Star game? If he hasn't, he should have been at some point, okay? But he would have at least been close. He would have been considered by people to be in that. Right. But I mean, like that that's the kind of level player. Pro baseball players already made a 1,500 at bats, and he's doing at least league average to above average depending on where he's at in the season. Uh, you're going to have to pay a little bit more I look at the White Sox and I go, okay, fine, you have these assets. Let's spend these assets wisely and bring in as much as we can because not all of it's going to work out. So let's let's throw a wide net with what we're willing to move on from, which is, again, another reason why the idea of moving on from Dylan Cease, knowing he's a Scott Boros client, knowing there's a bunch of control, knowing that a team would have to give up like a treasure trove to get him, but would be interested in those years of control when you know 
in a couple of years, he's going to free agency because Boris is never going to sign a deal with the White Sox before he tests free agency with his client. Like sign Gialitos and, and trade cease people, people that feel that way, that's where you get a huge return. Yeah, and, and there's going to be teams that might consider that, right? Tampa Bay might consider it. All of a sudden, their rotation's awfully thin. They like to develop guys, and they might sit there and go, we can take Dylan Cease and turn him into something ridiculous. You know, if we get our hands on him, and we've and they've got Jonathan Aranda, who's another second baseman, who's absolutely tearing it up in AAA and is sort of blocked by all of the myriad of infielders. I mean, the, the, the Rays are ridiculous because they seem to have, like, 15 of everything. They're, they're a prospect outlet store, the Tampa Bay Rays are. So, <laughs> Yeah, but whoever they trade the White Sox is going to be bad. That's the thing. Like, I would be like, oh, no, we made a trade with the Rays. But in terms of teams that might be interested, <laughs> that's that's the type of team that you're probably looking at and sit there going, okay, a team like that is going to want to do something like that. Or Atlanta with, you know, the the like the 12 guys that they've tried to have as a fifth starter, they might look at it and go, here, pick two of those. And this other guy for 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 Cease, you know, and, and give some well, higher you, end prospects. You could pick up a like couple that. of guys. Like I mean, I those trade simulators you find online, they're they're kind of they're just fun to play around with and stuff. But yeah, but I used one just to see if I was that far off. Like the Diamondbacks, in a race, right? They, if they really wanted to upgrade their pitching and bring in a guy like Cease that they could depend and, and they, upon, and they kind of do. They kind of the need to, right? So you could go after this big prospect that they just brought up, Brandon Fought. Yeah. You can bring him up and you you could you could grab him and probably somebody like a Ryan Nelson that would be at the back end of your rotation, hoping that fought becomes something that become that becomes really good at the top end of your rotation. And and I do believe he could be. You know, Zach Gallen pitched really well in that PCL league in AAA, and that is a hitter friendly league. And he pitched so well in that league that that's when everybody sat there and said, Ooh, maybe this guy's gonna be really good. Because when the ball is flying out in the thin air of where they play all those games, he's still keeping guys off base and he's really effective. Well, this guy here, he's also done basically the same thing. And but the Diamondbacks know that, so they may they may not want to. They know what they him. have. Yeah, and and these teams know what they have. You're hoping a team sits there and says, "Well, he's still a year or two away from being at the top. We need a guy right now because we want to go win it this year. Yeah. We feel like these teams are down in our division. This may be our best chance. All right, we'll move these pitchers to be able to bring in Cease. We got Cease for a couple more years, so we know he's going to be up at the top. So we'll roll the dice on that because we want to win now and still be good for a couple of years. Like that. That's what you'd get for a Dylan Cease. Again, this team... This team, I don't think they have the forethought to look at that, though. I don't, that's the thing. They're looking. They have tunnel vision on dealing Giolito and Lynn. And, and Lynn, of course, deal him. I understand that totally. The, the Giolito thing, I would want to just resign this guy, you know, because you have so many problems when it comes to your rotation. I would resign this guy. I, I'm, I'm surprised by the fact that they they just don't seem to be thinking that way. No, and, and I don't give Rick enough credit to sit there and say, you know, that publicly he's saying they're not going to make an attempt to resign him, so they're going to trade him with the thought and with the sort of, you know, wink, wink, nudge, nudge to Lucas, like, hey, you know, I'm going to call you in the offseason. You know I'm going to make you an offer here. But for right now, we're going to get something for you, and then we're going to try and bring you back in the fold. I was thinking about that idea that, hey, uh, we're going to trade you. You're going to go to a contender, and then let's sit down in the offseason. We're going to resign you, right? The problem is... You're letting a player leave the White Sox organization. To find out what it's like on the other side. Yeah, to see what a real professional organization is run like. Like, <laughs> what, what would it be like to be an L.A. Dodger, Lucas? <laughs> you think that guy's going to get a taste of the fact that it's not always a clown show and want to come back to where the organ music's playing? Come on now. Hailstorm Brewing Company is the official brewery of Socks in the Basement. I was just there on Sunday. Uh, just incredible food. They've got lunch now starting at 11 a.m. Tuesday through Sunday and also in the evening with that scratch kitchen. The smoked wings are spectacular. I got the ones that were uh, cherry buffalo sauce. Uh, there's, a, there's a little bit of a tang to it because of the cherry. And the buffalo sauce was hot, but not too hot for me. And, and it's just perfectly done. They're huge, too. I mean, sometimes you go out, you look for chicken wings. They're giving you these tiny little wings. They're giving you six of them. They're charging you 20 bucks. No, they're giving you ginormous wings. And if you split them in half, 
Now all of a sudden it looks like he got 12 of them and they're still jumbo wings at an incredible price. The beer is amazing. I had Dominatrix out there a couple of times. I was a little loopy. It's 11%, but I was having a good time. Uh, But again, get out there. Big giant beer hall. Beautiful. Beautiful patio. They got music on the weekends, all kinds of events during the week. Located in Tinley Park, 8060, 186th Street, right off of 80th Avenue. See more at hailstormbrewing.com. Joining us right now, the Sox nerd, Dave Marin from the scoreboard, which he does not sit inside. He is just uh, sitting there watching the scoreboard like the rest of us, but he's controlling all the tidbits and the knowledge that's up there on that board at the rate, and then he installs some of that knowledge into Sox in the basement. How are you, Dave? Chris, when I was a kid, my dream was to see the White Sox and Cubs play in the World Series. So intense was this dream, I once wrote a story in the sixth grade on a Sox-Cubs Game 7 Starting at Wrigley Field, continuing at Comiskey Park that night because of darkness at Wrigley Field, and ending with my mom waking me up as the drama was building. Get it? The story was about a dream because back then, the only way the Sox and Cubs were ever going to meet was in the Fall Classic. And with the ancient Paul Richards managing the Sox then, and Jim Marshall fronting the Cubs, the dream was the best case scenario. Not anymore. Interleague play coming up this week and in August has gifted us annual Sox-Cubs games. While the popular sentiment is that the novelty of these games has worn off, I say no way. I will admit this, though. Since the White Sox won the World Series, I haven't lived and died with the outcome of every Sox-Cubs game. Prior to that, I wanted the Sox to humiliate the Cubs every time they played, whether it was in an exhibition game, a spring training game, an old-timers game, or an interleague game. The most missed I ever was after a game was when Brant Brown beat the Sox with a walk-off homer in the franchise's first interleague game at Wrigley Field. Conversely, there were a few times in my life when I was more thrilled after a baseball game than when Mike Caruso beat the Cubs with a late-inning homer at Wrigley Field in 1999. Watching that ball fly over Sammy Sosa's head was so delicious. The enduring memories like those are the best thing about the Sox-Cubs series. The bragging rights are pretty cool, too. As I pointed out last week while battling on about next year's schedule, one win over the Cubs this year will guarantee that the Sox will hold the lead in the all-time series at least through 2024. Some other Crosstown Classic zingers, the only Sox reliever to beat the Cubs twice in the season was Billy Koch in 2003. Mark Burley is the Sox all-time leader with five wins against the Cubs. Tied for second at four are John Danks and Jake Peavy. The Sox best hitters among players with at least 13 at bats in a season against the Cubs are Jake Berger and Moises Sierra. I bet you haven't thought about that name in a while. Berger hit 462 against the Cubs last season while Sierra reached that number in 2014. And one more crazy one, Chris. Among players with at least 35 at bats against the Cubs, the Sox all time leader with a 368 average against the Northsiders is Adam Engel. If the at-bat minimum is dropped to 34, Luis Robert Jr. is the Sox career leader with a 412 average against the Baby Bruins. That's it, Chris. Probably more than you ever wanted to know about the Sox and their arch rivals to the north. Tell me the truth, my friend. Aren't you just a little tempted to sneak out before the game on Tuesday? I know you got to get the scoreboard ready at the rate. But 33rd in Princeton, Cork and Carey at the park, Nancy Faust playing from 5 to 7 p.m. on Tuesday night before that game. You'd love to get out and see some of that, right? I really would. That pod was fantastic. It was great hearing her. Yes, I would. You guys are going to have a great time. That that is going to be the best. You have Yuan Mankata, and this is going to be messy, I think, Ed. Yuan Mankata has his back issue, and I heard going into the weekend, his back issue was worse than originally thought, and it was going to take longer for him to rehab. Now Pedro's talking about he could be here as early as Tuesday on the team. Well, of course, because you, you don't need to be healthy to play for the Chicago White Sox. No! And when he gets here... 
Berger could be playing second base. We're back to this again. Which is all Jake's ever wanted, let's face it. And, and here's the thing. Here's the thing with that. This is going to be an absolute White Sox train wreck. They're going to take a guy who, sure, his average isn't great, but this is really the rookie season for Jake Berger. And they're going to take a guy who's on pace for easily 35 home runs this year and an OPS well over the league average in the high 700s. And they're going to take this guy and they're going to move him to a position he's not normally played. And they're going to put him over there and make it harder on him. Meanwhile, you're going to take a guy making $17.8 million this year, $24.8 million next year, plus a $5 million buyout in 2025 to avoid paying him another $25 million. Bring that guy back with an injured back and put him at third base. Because you can't admit that you gave bad money to him and that you're stuck with him at least through next year, giving him a ridiculous amount of money. So one guy has to be in the lineup because he's earned it, and the other guy has to be in the lineup injured, dealing with back issues to justify the bad money given to him by the front office. And now we're going to watch this play out here in the back half of the season between these two players. And I hope Jake Berger has been secretly training to become just the world's greatest second baseman. I hope that I hope that after after over a year of hearing with this hole in second base, why not just try Berger out there? That he goes out and just starts making plays, man. Oh like, yeah, he is just everywhere. See, the conspiracy theorist in me also says put Jake Berger at second base, make him look foolish. It will it will tamper down people pointing out how much of a better option he is over Yoan Moncada. We gave all the money to. Now, on the other hand, I'm with you. I want to see him go out like Ozzie Smith and do a backflip right when he starts at second base the first time. Just a Jake Berger backflip in the second. We're out there flipping burgers at second base. That's what we want. Flipping burgers. That's a new shirt. We can sell that one, too. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found and always on socksinthebasement.com.